the idea of Thanksgiving uh, is to come together and to give a little thought to what makes us fortunate, whether that's a religious impulse or whether that's just being grateful for you know, a year of good health, and I think that is something that is appealing about Thanksgiving. Americans have been coming together for centuries to celebrate Thanksgiving. The holiday has long had the power to bind generations and bridge cultural and religious divides, though it hasn't always been heralded as an annual nationwide event. Thanksgiving as we know it today can trace its beginnings to a small settlement struggling for survival at Plymouth Colony. In the fall of 1621, southern New England was a very fragile place. Plague had just swept through the native population and in some places reduced it by 90% or more, some communities entirely disappearing off the face of the earth. And for the pilgrims, that first winter, their number had been reduced from 102 by half. Survivors of that bleak first winter went to work in the spring, building homes and planting a variety of crops. Their efforts benefited greatly from the guidance of local Indians, including Squanto and Massasoit, chief of the Wampanoag tribe. The Indian corn that they planted gave them a wonderful yield. The English corns they brought, the wheat, the rye, the barley didn't do so well, but they were feeling confident enough that Governor Bradford sent four men out fowling. And in just a few hours, those four men were able to take enough turkey, ducks, geese, crane, maybe even eagle to feed the company for a week. So even though they'd just been through a very difficult winter, had lost half of their company, that yield in the fall of 1621 gave them hope. Along with this newfound sense of hope came a desire to give thanks. The surviving pilgrims hosted a feast to celebrate their good harvest. Squanto, Massasoit, and 90 of his Wampanoag men joined the English settlers for the celebration. When those communities came together here in Plymouth, you have two groups of people who have been through unimaginable suffering and were able to spend three days together feasting, making sports, diplomacy going on. And for me, one of the amazing things is that they couldn't speak to each other. The English couldn't speak with the native people and the majority of native people could not speak with the English either. There was probably some praying going on on both sides, probably for safety as well as for thanks for the food, you know, <laughs> um, and, and just reaching out in as friendly a way as they could at that point. Also, Indian people ate sitting on the ground. They didn't sit in chairs at a table. So that would have been very unusual to them. Some of the foods served are still traditional Thanksgiving fare today, but not all of them. When we look backward to the menu in 1621, there are some things that are still going to be on the table. The turkey was probably there. You would have had a variety of fowl. There would also have been fish and shellfish. And it's the time of year when nuts are coming in, possibly chestnuts, possibly walnuts. Certainly native plants, pumpkins, squash, uh, you know, those families of things, those were, those were Indian crops. I mean, they were part of the, the really what made up the most important uh, things that Native Americans grew. Uh, so you would recognize that, but I think it all would have looked very, very different than it does today. The feast shared by the pilgrim settlers and their Indian neighbors occupies a central place in our modern conception of Thanksgiving, thanks in large part to a discovery more than 200 years later. While doing research for a book, Boston minister Alexander Young came across the observations of Edward Winslow, a leading member of the Pilgrim Settlement. It so reminded him of the contemporary celebration of Thanksgiving that he put an asterisk against the letter, and at the bottom of the page you go down and says, this is the first Thanksgiving. When you read the one eyewitness account of this event, Edward Winslow's letter tells us Massasoit came with his 90 men, and then Edward Winslow adds, comma, amongst others, comma. And it's entirely possible there may be seven or eight other native communities here for those three days of feasting and sports and diplomacy. So our classic imagination is utterly wrong. If you asked anyone in 1621, is this a Thanksgiving? As Christians, they would have said no. For them, a Thanksgiving was a day of prayer and fasting. They would have recognized it as a harvest feast. But in the 1840s, that looked like Thanksgiving. 
One of the most important aspects of Native values is that of giving back and saying thank you. And so people have always said thank you. And there have always been ways of expressing that through food, through celebration. Whenever there's a food surplus, you have a feast. Native people were used to hosting visitors and, and were in the habit of, of laying out a big spread when someone would come, even if it wasn't harvest time. But they always had that notion of spirituality and the idea to give thanks. So it certainly wasn't the first Thanksgiving that happened between colonists and Indians. There had been many Thanksgivings before that. The Plymouth story may lie at the heart of our Thanksgiving traditions, but communities in Florida, Maine, and Texas also lay claim to hosting the first holiday. And in Virginia, English settlers at Berkeley 100 held a day of Thanksgiving upon their arrival in 1619, more than a year before the pilgrims landed at Plymouth. Captain John Woodleaf led some three dozen colonists up the James River to an 8,000 acre site in what is now Charles City County. The Berkeley Company Charter required settlers to mark the day of their arrival as a time for giving thanks. When they left England, they had been given a proclamation by the Berkeley Company, and there were 10 instructions in that proclamation. The very first instruction was once they landed, they needed to have a service of thanksgiving. And once they had that service, they needed to do it perpetually and annually from that point on. So Captain Woodleaf, uh, once they landed, they rowed ashore. Uh, as Clifford Doughty said in his book, The Great Plantation, they put their luggage on the hard ground, they surveyed the woods enclosing the, around them, they listened in complete silence, and then Captain Woodleaf asked them to pray. It shall be yearly and perpetually kept holy as a day of thanksgiving to Almighty God. Amen. They had the thanksgiving service for the next two years. It was 1619 when they landed. They also had it in 1620 and they had it in 1621 as far as we know. Then in, in the winter of 1622, there was the Indian uprising. They went up and down the James River attacking the settlements, including Berkeley. Now Captain Woodleaf was in England at the time this happened and his family was in Jamestown so they all were spared. But in Berkeley, 11 people died, many were wounded and that was basically the end of the settlement at that point as well as the end of many settlements along the James River. While researching Virginia history in 1931, Dr. Lyon Tyler, a former president of the College of William and Mary, uncovered the original charter requiring a day of thanksgiving for the settlers at Berkeley 100. Thirty years later, Virginia State Senator John J. Wicker Jr. used this discovery to advocate for recognition of the Commonwealth's place in the history of Thanksgiving with President John F. Kennedy. Back in 1962, President John F. Kennedy, in his Thanksgiving proclamation to the nation, referred to Massachusetts as the first Thanksgiving. Well, this Senator Wicker wrote a telegram to the White House saying, you're wrong, the first Thanksgiving was in Virginia. And so Arthur Schlesinger, the historian for the White House, wrote to Senator Wicker and said, due to our unconquerable New England bias at the White House, we were wrong, and it will be corrected in future Thanksgiving proclamations. So in Kennedy's next Thanksgiving proclamation, he listed Virginia and Massachusetts as having the Thanksgivings, Virginia first. President Kennedy acknowledging that was pretty important. Thank Senator Wicker for that, uh, because it, it pretty much put a seal on it that, hey, this is the real thing. I mean, the White House and the, the would not have acknowledged this had it not felt like it was, it was true. And of course it's true. It's, it's, it's in the papers, it's in the history books, it's, it's in the history documents from that period of time. Though the historical origins of Thanksgiving can be debated, the importance of the holiday to Americans today is hard to argue. It really is the holiday that we most love as Americans. 96% of Americans say they celebrate Thanksgiving. Not just take the day off, but celebrate it. I think because of the power of the holiday, it's why there are so many claimants to being the first Thanksgiving. The Pilgrims and the Wampanoag are now inseparable from the holiday. They've become its symbolic founders, but the holiday as we knew it grew from different streams of experience. It took time for Thanksgiving to develop into the annual nationwide holiday we recognize today. During the 17th and 18th centuries, it was common for individual colonies to celebrate days of thanks, 
typically in the form of autumn harvest festivals. The Continental Congress designated a number of days for Thanksgiving over the course of the American Revolution. President George Washington issued the first Thanksgiving proclamation of the new national government in 1789 and did so again in 1795. John Adams also set aside two days of Thanksgiving during his presidency, and James Madison marked the holiday a single time following the conclusion of the War of 1812. Thomas Jefferson, however, refused to issue a Thanksgiving proclamation during his two terms in office. He believed the president did not have the constitutional authority to direct the religious exercises of his constituents. Thanksgiving fared better at the state level. In 1817, New York became the first state to establish an annual Thanksgiving holiday. By 1858, 25 states, mostly outside the South, were observing an official day of thanks each year. Thanksgiving really picks up steam in 1863, when President Abraham Lincoln declares a national day of Thanksgiving, the fourth Thursday in November. A woman named Sarah Hale petitioned him to do this. She had been doing this for a number of years and finally found a receptive ear in Lincoln. A New Hampshire native, Sarah Hale was a prolific writer, publishing some 50 volumes of poetry and fiction. The godmother of Thanksgiving began calling for an annual national holiday in her publications in 1827. She also launched a letter writing campaign that continued for more than three decades. Lincoln was the fifth president to receive a missive from the persistent Hale. For Sarah Hale, I think the motivation in pushing for the holiday of Thanksgiving was a religious motivation. Her guiding principle in this was to remind Americans uh, what they owe God and the thanks that they ought to give to God at least once in a year as a nation. She edited one of the most successful ladies' magazines in the United States, so she had a, she had a platform to do this. And that's one of the reasons that Lincoln you know, received her letter and then within really a few weeks had turned around and proclaimed the holiday. When Lincoln makes this proclamation, realize we are still mostly an agricultural nation. And so the natural rhythms of life on a farm very much are in keeping with the timing of this proclamation in late November. It was a perfect time to do something because people were already thinking along the lines of being thankful, getting together. It was also a, a way to give thanks to God again for um, you know, the, the progress uh, in the Civil War. Lincoln was really looking for something to bring the country together in the middle of this war. Thanksgiving in Virginia is highlighted by a centuries-old ceremonial rite that has become attached to the holiday. Each year, representatives of Virginia Indian tribes present a tribute payment of wild game to the governor, thereby honoring the treaty terms that date back to 1677 and the Treaty of Middle Plantation. In the process, they assert their continued presence and distinct relationship with the Commonwealth. Well, by 1677, the Indian people had endured, uh, what, 70 years of intermittent hostilities and they weren't doing very well. The English had started to take over all the good farmland and were pushing them out and they'd been subjected to some episodes of disease. So they were looking for protection by 1677 and that's what the English promised them. And the Indians were supposed to provide tribute in the form of arrows or food um, to the English to show their mutual friendship. And that's the part that continues today at the governor's mansion, usually the day before Thanksgiving. It's really critical because it is still enacting the terms of this treaty. And so it's not just a, a quaint little observance that goes back to way back when. It's a continuing affirmation of the relationship between the native people and the Commonwealth of Virginia. Another holiday tradition unique to the Commonwealth has been underway since 1958. Each year, the Virginia Thanksgiving Festival takes place along the banks of the James River. Actors recreate the 1619 landing of Captain Woodleaf and his party of settlers on the grounds at Berkeley Hundred. The Virginia Thanksgiving Festival starts with a parade of horse-drawn carriages and fife and drum performers. We have colonial dancing, we have colonial games, the Chickahominy tribal dancers come, put on a show, 
And we always have a reenactment of the first Thanksgiving. It's a wonderful family-oriented day. It's becoming more and more well-known, and our, our mission is to let people know about the first Thanksgiving, this historic moment that really happened in Virginia. The 20th century introduced several new Thanksgiving pastimes that have become hallmarks of the holiday. Many families spend the morning watching the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, which dates to the 1920s. Professional football has been featured for almost as long. The Detroit Lions have taken the field every Turkey Day since 1934, while the Dallas Cowboys began playing on the holiday in 1966. Thanksgiving also marks the unofficial beginning of the Christmas shopping season. Americans nationwide prepare themselves to rise early the morning after and beat the crowds to Black Friday bargains. It really has changed to something that really reflects who we are today. It's a time for shopping. It's become an enormously important time for retail in the United States. We're more interested in things other than necessarily celebrating the harvest or thanking God uh, and become a much more uh, a day of togetherness and a day of frankly, consumerism. All things considered, the modern American Thanksgiving hasn't drifted too far from its harvest festival roots. 400 years later, the center of the Thanksgiving universe remains the dinner table. I think Thanksgiving, it's all about the food. The football and, and the other things that come with it are all great, but I think that food is focused on more than anything on that day. None of the other holidays have nearly the emphasis on things we cook and things we eat. I mean, what's the classic image of Thanksgiving? It's family after the meal sitting there, you know, loosening their belts and sitting back because they've stuffed themselves. That's an enormous part about, of what we do. It's a, a time of spectacular consumption in many ways. With other holidays, I often will break tradition a bit with what we serve. You know, let's try this this year, do something a little bit differently, but I tend not to mess with uh, Thanksgiving. When we look at our table today, you can actually tell where people are from based on what they put on their table. There is a writer for Gourmet Magazine who said, if I can look at your table, I can put you within 200 miles of where you come from. You will find differences depending on where, where you are. You know, uh, stuffing is a great example. You're more likely to find a cornbread style stuffing in the south as opposed to a regular bread stuffing maybe in the northeast. I believe pumpkin pie you would find a little more up north and then more of a pecan, sweet potato sort of thing in the south. The turkey, as both symbol and staple, has become synonymous with the modern Thanksgiving holiday. Americans everywhere can thank a Virginia farmer for his role in making the Big Bird the centerpiece of so many Thanksgiving dinners. In the 1920s, a enterprising farmer uh, and feed mill owner named Charles Wampler Sr. Uh, did some experimenting with incubating turkey eggs in, in a uh, hatchery and raising those turkey poults into uh, mature turkeys in a confined area. And so, that kind of gave rise to the modern poultry industry and Mr. Wampler is known as the father of the modern turkey industry and so it's, we really have some, some neat history here. <laughs> Thanksgiving is a, a very, very significant day for, the, for turkey producers. In Virginia we raise about 17 million turkeys a year uh, and uh, we rank sixth nationally. Some 90% of uh, Americans have turkey for Thanksgiving you're going to purchase a whole bird typically and it's going to be a, a hen that's uh, been grown to 13, 14, 15 pounds. Uh, that's what you're going to have for Thanksgiving. It is the centerpiece and kind of the tricky part of that I think is that uh, few people, fewer and fewer uh, as the years go by, roast large birds with, with any kind of regularity. So often it's like that one time a year that you do it. So. That can kind of complicate things for your average uh, home cook. When I was a kid, it was, I didn't know anybody that didn't uh, just stuff their turkey in the oven and, and take it out when they thought that it was done. Now you have the frying, you have the brining, and it really comes down to not overcooking it, which is where a lot of folks struggle. And the good news is that gravy is also really traditional as well, and I think that's partially come about because so many turkeys are overcooked. Thanksgiving doesn't end once the dishes are washed and the meal's remnants put away. The holiday feast continues as long as the leftovers hold out.
I'm increasingly meeting people who, who tell me that they don't really like leftovers day in and day out, but with the Thanksgiving leftovers, there's an exception there. So many of us remember from the time we were you know, kids to having that turkey sandwich the next day. So I believe once again, just tradition shining through. Thanksgiving to me is just a special time of the year. It's the, I think it's the best holiday of the year personally. Uh, it's a time to be with family. It's a time to recall happy memories. It's a time to celebrate. It's a time to eat good food. But it all comes about with just being thankful. It's not centered around gift giving and uh, it's, you know, you're enjoying a, a good meal, uh, hopefully with turkey on the table and uh, hopefully some football and just getting together with some family that maybe you don't see every day. There is something that is still sanctified about the holiday and its role that it plays in our lives as families and as, and as Americans, because I do think it's one of the last vestiges of the very best in us.